it's not play calling, but I will go over what the biggest challenge will be for Matt Canada and Kenny Pickett to get the Steelers offense going this year. We'll talk about that Kevin Dotson trade and what the real value was in that move, as well as what some of the tough cuts might have to be on defense for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm your host of the Locked On Steelers podcast, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on your favorite podcasting app and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making us your first listen every day because we're your team every day here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So. Let's get into a few things here. We will address the Kevin Dotson trade in a bit. Didn't feel like leading with that because I didn't think it was as huge of a deal. Um, but certainly something of, of interest that we will discuss in the second segment. What I want to lead with is talking about something that I discussed a little bit on Channel 11's uh, WPXI's The Final Word Sunday night. Uh, if you missed that, go on their website. You can find it there. Uh, it was a really fun episode with Dan Kangurski and Adam Crowley. But um, – I want to talk about Matt Canada and Kenny Pickett because a lot of people are going to talk about the play calling, the play calling, play calling, play calling. Everyone thinks that they are, they're a genius offensive coordinator and they could draw the best plays that would just always score touchdowns, even though that they don't know the first formation that they'd have to make. But I don't think that play calling is the biggest issue that the Steelers are going to face offensively this season with Matt Canada, as it pertains to how him and Kenny Pickett get the offense going. The concepts have been there. They're limited, but they've been there. And I said this last year when I was looking at all 22 film, like there were guys open in the middle part of the field that Kenny Pickett just wasn't targeting. Uh, and Mitch Trubisky also wasn't targeting too often. There were opportunities here and there, and sometimes they weren't called freak as frequently as you think they'd like. But when you had a rookie quarterback who you were trying to protect him from making too many mistakes while also relying on your defense to win, it was understandable that things that the things were a bit tight tighter back then. But the concepts were there. People who think that Matt Canada couldn't drop a good offensive play, I think we're just being Steelers fans, being mad that the Steelers offense has just been bad, and it has been. But I think that, that like, like, like when you go back and you look at it and you actually study the X's and O's, where guys are going, what opportunities were there, there was potential last year, but things just didn't work out because a lot of different reasons. And that just is happens when you have a rough offensive line to start the season, a rookie quarterback figuring things out in an offense that really doesn't have an identity yet. And I, I think what this Steelers offense will have this year is an identity. And I don't think it's going to be just ground and pound. I think it's going to be going to be a balanced offense. And the key is though, to establish that balance. And that is what I think is the real test here. And if you look back at how this preseason worked i think that they've addressed some of that balance if you remember last year during different times of the season i thought big bat canada's biggest question mark that I, I didn't know if he'd he'd be able to achieve would be if he could get players to just buy in on his offense to get them to understand what needs to be done to work different concepts and that's not an easy thing to do the, you know because you got to get guys to see things even when there's not success to trust that hey this is going to be there this is going to work it just needs these things to click and uh you know there was obvious and natural frustration with the Steelers offense with the way things you know fluttered uh last year and the year before when Ben Roethlisberger was, was the quarterback uh but in this preseason, that wasn't an issue. They seemed to be able to understand. They seemed to be able to hit the concepts. Kenny Pickett was, was was totally familiar. The team was totally familiar. Seemed like they were pretty confident. And I think that, you know, one thing that Kenny Pickett definitely saw in his time at Pitt, um, because he started with a different offensive coordinator. Eventually, they settled in on Mark Whipple as his offensive coordinator. And there used to be a lot of complaints in Pittsburgh. And I remember this. I remember that. And this, uh, this I think this is a really funny parallel with Matt Canna. But if you were, if you're a Pitt fan, you probably remember there was a lot of complaints about Mark Whipple. Now the one complaint that was legitimate was I still don't understand why he had players literally running to the sideline with, or sending running a player, making his quarterback run back and forth from the sideline to get the play calls. That's a whole nother thing. But Mark Whipple was blamed for a lot of things that weren't his fault for drop passes, for things just not working in the right times, the right places. But Kenny Pickett 
stuck with it the entire time. And by his first senior year, because remember he had two senior years because of the COVID waiver, but in his first senior year, I think that something started to click for him. And that's when Mark Whipple was like, no, this guy's figured it out. Like he, he knows what needs to happen to make this offense go. And then in his second senior year, it all came together. And before that second senior year in 2021, when he, you know, was, you know, finished third in the Heisman voting, but you know, before that, nobody thought Kenny Pickett was a, a first round draft pick quarterback. There were, there was, you know, and maybe he did, maybe Pitt did, but as far as the national media, there were a lot of people down on him because he had thrown 13 touchdowns and nine interceptions for back-to-back seasons. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then seriously, he actually did those numbers. That's not me making that up. That's me just dropping a good 13, nine in there. Uh, but, in all seriousness, he saw the potential in that offense before anyone else did and then brought it to the light. And then he you know, had a record year where he broke Dan Marino's record and ACC records and all that. I think something similar, and he's not record-breaking this year, but I think something similar might happen with Matt Canada because he's I, – I, Matt, Matt, he, I think that Kenny Pickett is seeing in the, in the playbook – what needs to happen for Matt Canada's offense to work, how you need to operate, how and, and part of it is that balance. You go back throughout this preseason and how Kenny Pickett would distribute the ball to not just George. He wouldn't fixate on George Pickens. He wouldn't fixate on, on Deontay Johnson or Pat Fryer. But he would find them at different spots. And it really looked like he was going where he was going with the football predicated on what he was seeing in the defense and not committing to a player because he trusts them at one point. And listen, there will be times in NFL players' careers where sometimes you got to trust the dude if you have the dude on your roster. Like Ben Roethlisberger hitting San Antonio Holmes in the Super Bowl. That was just who he needed to hit in that in, uh, on that last drive, and it came came to work for them. But we've seen how when, play, when, when players or quarterbacks get too reliant on one or two players and how that can have a backlash – um, if something goes wrong, if one of those players get hurt, like in 2016, now this was an extreme because the Steelers also dealt with a, a lot of injuries to the wide receiver position. But when Le'Veon Bell went down in the AFC championship game, the Patriots just blanketed Antonio Brown. They said, okay, Ben, beat us with Eli Rogers and Kobe Hamilton and see how that goes. And it didn't go well for the Steelers. The, the Patriots ended up winning that, that AFC championship game. Um, but that's where the Steelers won't run into this season because they have – Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, Pat Fryer with Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, Allen Robinson, even Calvin Austin, good in that mix, and maybe even Darnell Washington. I, I really look at how this offense is 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 built. Is that if you hyper focus on one or even two players, there's two other players that are they'll probably be on the on the field at any given time who can rip your head off and be and be big playmakers. And I think that could be the key to what makes this Steelers offense truly dangerous for people to stop is that if they start to overcommit to one person or one aspect, the, the other aspect can hit them really hard and force them off of it. And that's where the Steelers can dictate the pace of how games go, which is so important in the NFL and all football. You want to be the, the, the team that sets the tone and so that if the other team is going to take control of the game it's because they've countered you but you are setting the tone for them to have to rise to and then you can see them coming you can and i think that's that's the bottom line is uh it, for, for the offense and the steelers haven't had an offense to do that for quite some time and again it comes back to being balanced uh you know one of my one of the games that i i, I broke down years ago and this was the the falcon super bowl everyone talked about 28 to 3 uh and how they blew that lead and how could they blow that lead but one of the things that i noted going into the game was if matt ryan who won mvp that year uh, the quarterback for the falcons if matt ryan was able to distribute the football evenly across across all of his targets the Patriots would have a hard time. And in the first three quarters, he did that. And in the fourth quarter, when it was all on the line and he just needed, uh, he just knew he just needed a couple more plays, he started hyper focusing on Julio Jones and that played into the Patriots' hands. I think there's quite a few defenses out there that are starting to play more like that, take away the top option, make you beat, 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 make you beat them with all the different backups. And the Steelers, or not the backups, excuse me, but the secondary weapons to the team's primary weapon uh, in the passing game. But I think the Steelers are in a position where they have so many weapons that have to be treated seriously that any effort to take away, to hyper-focus on one of them, to spotlight one of them and, and, and say, hey, we're going to take that one guy away is leaving them, is leaving everyone else with one-on-one -on -one opportunities to make big plays. And Kenny Pickett, I think, is the smart enough quarterback to take advantage of that. Again, finding the balance will be key to force teams into making tough decisions like that. But if they do, the Steelers' offense 
will be pretty doggone good. I want to talk about the Kevin Dotson trade in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Don't go anywhere. We still have a lot to talk about that and some cuts coming up because, as, as we know, Tuesday is cut day in the NFL, August 29th. We'll get to all that and more here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. But first, I want to remind you guys that this show is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. August is here, and you know what that means. It's the official start of Fantasy Football Drafting Month. Get championship ready for your home league by trying out our best ball on Underdog Fantasy. All you do is one live snake draft, no waivers, no trades. Underdog sets your best lineup every week. Try it out with Underdog's Best Ball Mania Tournament, the largest fantasy football contest of all time is back and even bigger with 15 million dollars in total prizes up for grabs including an absurd three million dollars going to the winner last year the winner drafted their team in july so don't wait around visit underdogfantasy.com to, or find them in the app store and sign up with the promo code locked on that's l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n locked on all capital letters all one word and you'll get your first deposit doubled up to 100 dollars. that's underdog fantasy promo code locked on Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. We continue with our show here. Let's get to the Kevin Dotson trade here. Now, breaking this down step by step, Kevin Dotson has been traded, and this was something that was thought to be a possibility for the Pittsburgh Steelers because of the depth that they've developed it inside, uh, inside interior offensive line with the signing of Nate Herbig, uh, with you know the, the, the drafting of Spencer Anderson potentially, and maybe even the growth of Kendrick Green at guard, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, Kevin Dotson, a guy who made 30 starts for the Steelers as a fourth-round draft pick, had been decent at times, but also could be really bad. If you remember our grades for him on this very show last year, I think he graded out to have like a C-plus or something like that, and it was because, man, he had some really, really good games, but he also had some really, really bad games, and those kind of balanced each other out. So coming into this season, or well, coming into this offseason, it was thought that, well, if he's at left guard, they could survive. They, they could do well with him there, and if as long as they built, else, built elsewhere around him. Uh, but then the Steelers in free agency realized they could get a major upgrade in Isaac Samalo, and then they signed him to a contract. And then that was that. Isaac Samalo took the job. Samalo. It wasn't even a question. Once Samalo was signed, there was no more, oh, is Kevin Dotson going to start? No, that was that was a done deal from, from the jump there. Um, and then you just had Kevin Dotson just kind of, you know, Work work on being work on being a backup. He you know he dealt with some bumps and bruises throughout training camp, and you know now this move sends him away in the fourth year of his contract. And this is a guy with thirty NFL starts, uh, so a lot of teams probably looking at him and saying like, hey, um, you know this guy, uh, uh, the, the, you know this guy's got NFL starting experience. He's been with a first team offense. He know he knows the you know, how, how the game works. So it, it makes sense for a team to want him. And the question was, you know, how much could the Steelers get back for him if they if they really wanted him? And they ended up get what they ended up doing was two trade swaps. So the Steelers essentially gave up a fifth and a sixth round draft pick, the fifth for 2024 and the sixth for 2025. And then the Rams gave up their fourth and fifth round draft picks for 2024 and 2025. So essentially what they did was they just moved up by a round on, the, on their day three picks for uh for two for two of their picks over over the next two seasons so or the next two drafts so uh they got some dra- some dra- tra- uh, draft compensation in this trade which makes which makes sense and honestly it was a move to capitalize on because they knew that they weren't going to be starting Kevin Nonson and they knew they weren't going to want to pay him to stick around to be a backup they could probably you know draft another guy and, and not have to pay them veteran money to do so to to be in that position so in this way you're not you know whereas yes you do lose a depth piece who knows how to start on your offensive line and knows how to contribute um if you know if Seomala was to go down or if other guys but I, I think the bottom line for Dotson uh became you know hey like this is your fourth year this is basically a rental that they're giving the Rams so the Rams get this guy for a year and then you know we'll we'll see what happens um but uh, but this way you get draft compensation and it's not like you held on to him just so he could be a backup and then you got zero for him. And that's one of those risky things. You know, it's, it's it depends on how you want to you handle it, because, uh, you know, you could say, oh, man, like, you know, that this was this was a big gamble because what it did was is that it put pressure on like, hey, if, if there's some interior guard injuries, you just traded away one and that could put you in some uh, some, some rough situations there. But 
I, I think this, what the Steelers are doing, they're trusting that their guys are going to be healthy. They're trusting that they don't have to kind of go overboard in that department. Uh, and I think they're also trusting that guys like Nate Herbig and even maybe Spencer Anderson and Kendrick Green can step up in that in that in that resort. Now, I, I think it was interesting to see that Kendrick Green got a little bit of first team snaps at right guard uh, against the Falcons uh, and looked fine, like he wasn't noticeably as bad. And maybe the question with Kendrick Green is just don't have him at starter, at starting at center or, or playing center at all because that's where the bulk of his mistakes mistakes have been. So. You know, maybe we see something else there, uh, and maybe that's why Kevin Dotson's gone is because the Steelers knew, hey, you, you got this guy, this guy over here, and that guy over there. Don't necessarily need this guy who's only going to be around for another year or so, anyways. And, and but I think also like this is really good value for a fourth round pick, right? Like, what? How many fourth round picks do you do you see in the NFL? turn into guys who get 30 NFL starts and then earn, earn you trade compensation at the end of their year. I, I I don't think that that happens too often in the fourth round. I'm not going to look that up to see how often that happens because I just don't have the means to do that right now. Um, but I, I think the bottom line is that, you know, th this is, again, I think really good value for what the Steelers are we're looking for here to get rid of um, to get rid of Kevin Dotson and figure out how they wanted to handle the interior offensive line position. So um, there's a there's a lot of things here and um, I, it makes you wonder what other plays are out there for for Omar Khan um, when it comes to the NFL because you know the Steelers you know they had you know they had some, some extra talent at interior offensive linemen. I can see. Um, I can see, you know, defensive line being another group that becomes a part of that shuffle and seeing maybe if, if a team wants, you know, someone from there, uh, we'll get into depth chart things in the next segment. But I, I just think that right now there could be other plays out there to increase, um, uh, this, the Steelers draft capital right now. But I, I think that that's, uh, that it's a little premature to try to predict where those moves might be right now. Um, but, uh, but moving on to the point of where what I think this move also means for the roster right now is that the Steelers are expressing faith in a few things. One, they're expect they're expecting Kendrick Green, Spencer Anderson to, to, to be really to, to be uh, you know a part of this. Nate, Nate Herbig has to also be part of this and probably is your your top center. But they're going to be they're going to be expe expecting this group to step up when injuries do happen. And I think that that's where the Kevin Dotson trade, you know, makes you scratch your head a little bit. If you're sitting there like, well, Kevin Dotson wouldn't have had a problem plugging and playing. And I hear you. I, I agree. If, if they run into some problems um, and, uh, and, and, you know, they have some injuries on the interior offensive line and then they're having to start a guy that doesn't know what he's doing there and it crumples the whole thing. That would be a tough situation, situation to be on. But I think that in this space uh, that the Steelers are in right now, I think they can afford to uh, to trade. Trust that some of these younger guys will catch on in the interior part of the line. Um, trust that if some if one person does get injured, there's other veterans on the line who will help them out, and just take it one step at a time. I think that's where the, that's that's where they're at with the Kevin Dotson trade now, um, and uh, you know we'll see how that how that plays out and see you know how this looks because now you got two fourth round picks uh, next year, and then you got two fifth round picks the year after that, so. Could be some interesting movements coming down down the line here. I want to talk about the defense a little bit here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. So we'll get to that in just a minute here because uh, Kevin Dotson trade. I think it's very straightforward for what they're getting. I think it's it's good value if you're if you're losing a guy at the end of the year. Anyways, get the guy now and then just kind of sit on it and then uh, um, you know get the trade value now as you're sending the guy out. Uh, and then sit on it, see what happens with it. And then who knows what that trade capital can lead to if to trade ups, trade downs later on. But Omar Khan still doing the thing. Now let's switch to defense here in a minute, in a minute here, because I do want to talk about some of the tough cuts that are coming here. And it's it's going to be interesting to see who who actually makes the team. But interesting in a very good way. And I'll explain what that good way is. Uh, in a minute here on the Lockdown Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. But first, before we do anything else, I want to remind you guys that this show is sponsored by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. That's why Game Time is the app that's here for you. And you could it's a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events new you. You get cured killer de de deals on last minute tickets and you get their best price guarantee that just can't be beat. So you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you're about to have. The Game Time app allows you to book tickets up to the last minute 
spend it, even if you didn't plan far out in advance. I don't know about you all, but there's some times where I just miss out on, on planning ahead and I need to get tickets right away. That's where GameTime.co comes in and they'll get you exclusive flash deals on tickets for all events like football, baseball, basketball, concerts, comedy, theater events, and more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find the tickets in the same section in a row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create a code. An account and then use code locked on NFL. That's L O C K E D O N N F L, all capital letters, all one word, and you'll get $20 off your first per- purchase. Or go to their website, gametime.co. Terms and conditions apply. Create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's switch topics here. We've talked a lot about the offense. I want to talk about the defense a little bit here. And I've talked a little bit about this, but I think that the Steelers are in a position where there's not going to be some easy cuts here for this defense because there are prospects that you like, there's players that you like, and it's going to force your hand uh, to make some tough calls here. Now, let's start up front where everything always starts, in the trenches. And you look at the guys that are obviously going to be around Cam Hayward, Larry Ogunjobi, DeMarvin Leal, uh, Keanu Benton. Those to me guys are the, are the, are the four guys that you're, that, that you're locking in there and just, you know, that they're going to be there. So the question is who are the last three that you keep? Well, I think the first of the last three that you definitely keep is Isaiah Loudermilk because he stood out um, throughout training camp. And I think that he, you know, he's a young guy. Uh, fifth round pick that they've traded up for a few years ago. And I think he's filling in his frame. He's finding his size and finding his strength. And that's what you want to see uh, from him uh, moving forward. Uh, Montrevious Adams. So the last two is Montrevious Adams. I, I think, you know, he has uh, put himself in a position where he can be relied upon. And so you can call him, put him up on the first team, put him on the second team. He'll fit in, find a way and be a, a dangerous a dangerous guy. The, 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 but the last spot, if they were to keep seven defensive linemen, which I think that they very well could do, you got to get Brayden Fahoko. You got to get that guy who can, is a run stuffer. It's going to bring that energy and be that guy in the middle of the defense. I, I think it makes the world of a difference if you're able to get a guy like Braden Fahoko on the field, just to even just for a few plays here and there, just to let the other team know that hey, this guy's this 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 guy's could be a problem for you if you try to run the ball up the middle when he's when he's on the field. Uh, so Braden Fahoko, uh, certainly some someone that I think the Steelers should keep there, which means you're going to have hard decisions because there's a lot of other people that you're probably talking to. Um, uh, you know, as, as far as like, you know, who's on the defensive line, uh, you're probably you're probably looking at like, oh, man, Armin Watts. I mean, just looking at this, looking at this depth chart here. I mean. Armin Watts, Jonathan Marshall, you can see easily going Manny Jones, but like Armin Watts is a tough one to to to, to let go of because I think that he what brings that another veteran experience there. But that's one of the many facets I think can be a really good thing for the Steelers is that they actually have real competitions to challenge people with here. But I do think, again, it's going to be Braden Fajoko, who's part of who's part of that seven uh, for the Steelers defensive line. But we also got to talk about, um, you know, the nickel cornerback situation, because currently as it stands, the nickel cornerback is held down by Shannon Sullivan and Elijah Riley. And Elijah Riley has just been an upstart. Shannon Sullivan's the starter officially at, at nickel right now, just because they had to release a depth chart. But Elijah Riley, man, he's right on it. And I think they're going to find a way to fit him on this team, just at least for a special team's um, ability, because I think that he can be a true threat uh, at different parts of the of the field. Um, so uh, that that's another thing to fact to factor in there. Um, another group that I, I think is going to be really interesting is linebacker, um, because when you look at how the linebackers are built right now, it's obvious like who the top four are right like you go to you go to inside linebacker you got cole holcomb you got landon roberts quan alexander mark robbins those are your those are your solidified to each um you know they, they, they can they can hold down each, each spot but it makes you wonder are they are they missing out on someone else here that could be just as impactful moving forward or are they limiting themselves um 
in that situation. I, I really liked Nick Kwiatkowski or Kwiatkowski, excuse me, but then he got hurt and it's been a, it's been rough for him since. Um, but I do like the Steelers linebacker situation. I think it's going to be much better than last year, or the year before that. Um, but I, I think the biggest question will be, you know, when, when you're looking at, at the, at the linebackers and you're seeing, um, you're seeing how they're built. It's like, you can't have too many injuries because if you have one, it's fine. Two will put you in a, in a rough spot. Um, you know, if you're, if you're talking about losing guys, then you're going to have to start looking more for inside linebackers. And then you're, you'll feel like you're back to square one. Um, but uh, linebackers, I think right now is totally fine. I, if, that might be a position where if, if I'm, if I'm the Steelers though, I might try to keep a fifth on that spot just to kind of keep, another body that's in your favor. Um, uh, you know, just if in case the inside linebacker room uh, gets hit, hit up by just two injuries, and then you will have still have a healthy rotation there. So inside linebackers is another one. And then the question of which four safeties do they take? Now we know the top three make if it's Patrick DeMonte, KZ and Keanu Neal are all in there, but does Trey Norwood get it? Does Miles Killer get it? Do both get it? These are all going to be, you know, tough questions, but I do think that the Steelers safeties again, look across the board here. You're not, and my, my, I, I have this discussion with my old man and uh, my, my, my shout out to my pops. But one thing he says is like, it's Chris, it just feels like the Steelers. They're not having to decide who they want to keep. They're having to decide who they have to let go. And what he means by that is that in years past, it's just been like, all right, I guess we'll keep this guy at wide receiver. I guess we'll keep this guy on the, on the in the secondary. No, it's like this year. It's it's like, hey, do you uh, you know, you, they're actually screening, you know, you know the talent that they're looking at here, um, you know, because they're able to see, okay, this is the competition we wanted to see. This is how they responded to the competition. Bing, bang, boom. We've seen it. This is who we're gonna go with. This is who we're gonna keep. Um, and I think that that's the way to approach this. I think that you're the way that the way that you're looking at it and see like, hey, you know what? They're they're taking their time. They're not rushing things. Um, they're making they're they're trying to make the right decisions. I truly believe that the Steelers see this as a good problem to have. Mike Tomlin says this, you know, good problems to have as one of his Tomlinisms. Um, you know, and uh, because again, they got depth across the board, and that could make them what makes that that could be the factor that makes them such a dangerous team. And again, it all goes back to you know Kenny Pickett and, and Matt Canada. Can they establish that that offensive balance? Because when you do, it makes it so much harder for a defense to nitpick at cer at certain things. Um, so I, I think that that could be that could be the real key to this team is getting that offense going like that. And then we'll just see on Cut Day Tuesday who they keep around to keep keep along in that fight. We'll have a lot more all throughout the week here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Read my work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Pitt football's back this weekend, so we got a whole bunch of stuff going on this week, getting you ready for that as college football is fully back in swing again. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can check me out on, your, on the Locked On Steelers podcast, on your favorite podcasting apps, and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And as I said before, as I always say, if you go on Apple Podcasts, rate us five stars with a positive comment. Uh, I will be sure to give you a shout out during the show. Like this person, we got Danny M.M. Oh, uh, zero zero who says thank you five stars giving us Steelers fans what we want to hear great content thank you Danny MM for your for your five star review rating and review if you want if you want your shout out do the same thing go on Apple Podcast rate us five stars leave us a comment uh, and uh, you know and make and leave us your name there Sue so we can get, we can give you the proper shout out thanks again for tuning in to Locked On Steelers we'll see you Tuesday more right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. <laughs> 